we no longer question the military prowess and supremacy of ancient Rome. However, it wasn't always the case. Rome and Carthage, which is another significant Mediterranean power, fought each other repeatedly during the majority of the 3rd century BCE, and Rome faced its biggest threat ever, as it was standing at the forefront of the bloodiest of all wars, which we today know as the Second Punic War. Rome eventually won, but it never forgot the man who had orchestrated its most shameful defeat, Hannibal Barca. Hannibal Barca is regarded as one of the most outstanding military leaders in history. He was a great general and a master strategist, yet Rome dreaded no one more than him. We know you're eager to know the reason behind the same, so without wasting any time, let's find out why. Hamilcar Barca, Hannibal's father, brought his nine-year-old son to a temple at Carthage to take an oath of eternal hostility toward Rome as he prepared for Spain. The well-known story is a beautiful representation of Hannibal's personality and his life's work, which has been to subdue and humiliate the young republic and bring Carthage back to its former glory. But we shouldn't overlook the fact that the victorious side was the one that documented this tale. Unfortunately, no sources from the Carthaginian era have survived. After all, the Greek historian Polybius, who recounted Hannibal's life and participation in the conflict, worked for Rome. Despite the apparent bias, this narrative could have been a grain of truth. The Barsids, one of the most famous Carthaginian families, were Hannibal's home. They were also Rome's ferocious enemies. In fact, Hannibal's father himself was a well-known general in the First Punic War. Carthage was defeated and lost most of its overseas possessions, including Sicily, a wealthy island, at the end of the Twenty-Year War. Additionally, it was required to pay Rome hefty war reparations. Hamilcar Barca decided to increase Carthage's power and territory over the Iberian Peninsula, modern-day Spain, and Portugal to prevent the collapse of his nation. On a second note, the resource-rich Iberian gold and silver mines could be exploited to pay Rome's reparations and support Carthage's army. In 237 BCE, Hamilcar and his young son embarked on this trip. The old man fought in Iberia for nine years, increasing Carthage's influence over the peninsula. Hannibal was raised in a military camp, and by age 18, he was in charge of the army and all the Carthaginian forces in the Iberian Peninsula following the deaths of his father in 228 BCE and his brother seven years later. He quickly established his family's military and commercial dominance at the seaside city of Cartagena, where he promptly solidified his control in Spain. But the Senate of Rome decided to take action after becoming concerned about the Barsid's influences unregulated and fast development in the peninsula. As a result, Rome teamed up with Saguntum to weaken Hannibal's power in the area. A previously made treaty established the Ebro River as the boundary between the Roman and Carthaginian spheres of power. Hannibal believed that Saguntum's location far south of the Ebro River constituted a treaty violation. In 219 BCE, he surrounded the city and finally took it after eight months. At this point, Rome seized the chance to demand that Carthage hand over Hannibal, and so the Second Punic War went underway. The disadvantageous strategic condition that Carthage was in was well known to Hannibal. While the Roman soldiers far outnumbered his army, Roman naval superiority blocked a frontal attack from the sea. A weaker leader would have chosen to go on the defensive, making the Ebro a formidable fortress. But Hannibal Barca was no ordinary leader. He was a military genius and about to demonstrate his brilliance to the world in the most impressive manner imaginable. Hannibal would attack the enemy on his home turf, bringing the war to Italy. Hannibal and his army crossed the Ebro and headed north in the late spring of 218 BCE. It was not an easy road. He withdrew part of the forces to monitor the routes and defend his back after defeating the hostile tribes in the Pyrenees. Sources claim that he led 40,000 troops, 12,000 riders, including the renowned Numidian cavalry, and 38 war elephants into southern Gaul. Hannibal agreed with the local leaders to cross the Rhone before the Roman army could stop him rather than engage in battle with the Gauls. Late in October, he reached the foothills of the Alps after successfully evading the Roman troops and outwitting the hostile locals. The Romans returned to Italy after learning that the enemy had escaped to set up their fortifications for the spring. They believed that only a lunatic would attempt to go via the Alpine passes this far into the year. Unfortunately for the Romans, Hannibal was a lunatic, 
His alpine adventure became the stuff of legend. The army started its ascent before abandoning all of its siege engines and a portion of its supply train before the crossing. It took a very long time to cross. The troops had to contend with brutal winter weather, unforgiving terrain, avalanches, blizzards, and shallow temperatures. The savage tribes that resided in the highlands continuously attacked the column. Food was in short supply, and several soldiers were on the verge of mutinying. But Hannibal pulled off the seemingly impossible, and 17 days later, the damaged column's front appeared in the Po Valley. However, he lost almost all of his elephants, and what was left of his army was in poor shape. Fortunately, Hannibal's army was swiftly restocked and prepared for the fight, thanks to a combination of diplomacy and force and the surrounding tribes uprising against Rome. The Romans were startled by the enemy forces' abrupt presence at their door. They dispatched General Scipio to intercept them since they were fast to respond. The two armies collided near the Ticino River in November 218 BCE. Due to his severe injuries, Scipio was forced to flee after the Romans were routed. This was the first of many victories Hannibal would have in Italy that would push Rome to its lowest point. Carthage's triumph at Ticino was small, but it was a sign of coming things. A month later, Trebia was a significant victory. More Romans perished in the freezing river attempting to flee for their lives. The Roman army is thought to have lost between 20,000 and 30,000 soldiers, as opposed to only a few thousand on Hannibal's side. Hannibal's victory in the Battle of Trebia was tremendous because the local tribes soon sided with him after learning of his victory. A new triumph quickly followed. Rome resisted giving up despite the military failure. To rescue the Republic, the Senate installed Quintus Fabius Maximus as dictator. Fabius had a reputation as a delayer who ran away from direct conflict and pursued a scorched-earth strategy that denied Hannibal's army of essential supplies. Although this tactic was successful, the Senate, which desired an immediate triumph, did not like it. As a result, they received combined command over a sizable force of around 80,000 soldiers. The mission of Rome's most enormous army in history was to stop Hannibal. Hannibal anticipated that the Romans would pursue him, and so made preparations. He took control of a significant supply depot close to Cannae, a town on the Adriatic coast, to incite the Romans to attack. The two armies met outside of Cannae to crush the Carthaginian foot troops in the middle of the line. Varro, who was in charge of the military on that particular day, crammed his legionaries closely together. As soon as Varro made his move, Hannibal exploited his deep formation against him. He positioned experienced heavy soldiers on the flanks and light infantry in the middle of his line. As a consequence, a maneuver was created that is being taught at military academies today. Hannibal's soldiers withdrew in the middle as the Romans attacked, but the flanks remained solid. More and more legionaries were attracted to assault the center as Hannibal's line gradually assumed the shape of a crescent. But the Romans were being led into a trap they were unaware of. Roman troops numbering in the tens of thousands soon found themselves surrounded by the enemy. A lot of the Romans were unable to wield their swords due to the formation's extreme closeness to the cavalry of Carthage struck the last blow. Roman troops on the front hardly realized how dangerous their situation was, and it was then too late. Their sight had entirely disintegrated by the time night fell, and towards the end, it had been completely destroyed. The Battle of Cannae was Rome's worst defeat in history, both as a republic and later as an empire. Rome's biggest nightmare may have been Hannibal of Carthage, but he was also their most incredible teacher, fundamentally altering their military and culture. From Livy through Ammianus, Marcellinus, the finest Roman authors, idolized Hannibal. The magnificent marble-covered mausoleum emperor Septimus Severus, built for the legendary commander centuries after his passing, became a popular destination for pilgrims. The Romans erected statues of their greatest foe as a symbol of reluctant respect and as proof of their final victory. From Julius Caesar to Napoleon Bonaparte to George S. Patton, Every great leader has been required to understand the strategy and tactics used by Hannibal. Unfortunately, the most famous military schools still use the double envelopment at Cannae as the textbook example of a perfect fight, which resulted in tragedy for the Romans. Rome eventually overcame Hannibal, but his legacy lives on to this day.
And that was it about Hannibal. If you enjoyed watching this video, make sure to hit the like and subscribe button. We'll see you next time. Until then, stay mythically mad.